about this, talk about that. Uh, so the way this will work is we'll just, I'll just do like a brief intro, some input, and then let's just chat. Um, so in terms of social movements, so let's just have a working definition of what they are. So in general, I, you are mostly aware of this, they are a form of collective action, right? So there's some degree of organization and cohesion, but this varies across movements. So some movements are more formally organized than others, have a greater hierarchy than others. So some feminist organizations are more committed to like a flatter hierarchy, you know, looser organization. But of course that has trade-offs, right? The more organized you are, the easier it is to apply for funding, the easier it is to lobby, but then that also means it's quite likely that the more vulnerable members of your movement are uh, you know, less represented then, right? So these are issues in the movement. Next is usually, and especially in debate land, we tend to talk about movements that are uh, progressive. So those that emerge in response to inequality and oppression, things like that. So uh, African American rights movement, uh, LGBT rights, women's movement, liberation movements, right, workers. But actually, we do also have um, not progressive social movements. So movements that mobilize around like ethnic nationalism or religious fundamentalism. We are less likely to talk about them in debating. But to be honest, there are genuine debates there, probably. Um, so basically, if there is an identifiable membership base, some degree of collectivization, uh, and they coalesce around a certain identity. Uh, sometimes this identity is very, very clearly defined. So like workers, workers groups in a specific industry or sector. Sometimes it's a bit broader. Like so feminists rally around the identity of women, but that identity is not a very stable and fixed identity. Right? There are so many differences among women as well. So even the identities are sometimes contested. But you can kind of like make out the boundaries, right? Um, and then, just a few more like frameworky things, then let's let us know. So, a lot of the discussion about movements, I think, are first the question of what needs to change and why. So, how do movements understand the problem will affect the solutions that they can do support, right? So, how do they define the problem? So, I'll give feminist key examples because that's probably where I'm most useful. <laughs> but, so, um, You've encountered emotions like feminists support the full decriminalization of sex work versus feminists who are against sex work and they want to ban buying sex at least, right? Or their views on cosmetic surgery are quite different. Or the idea of choice feminism where any decision you make should be seen as generally empowered as long as it's informed, um, including the decision to do things like wear makeup or like sell sex or appear in porn. Or the whole idea that can you actually be a feminist but disagree with the right to abortion? Um, so some examples of how these debates will play out, like where are the fault lines? The fault lines will depend on how they understand the problem. So some feminists will argue that you know capitalism is inherently the problem because it entrenches inequality. And because the way capitalism operates is that it, it functions in a patriarchal context. So women will always lose in terms of how much uh, they work in terms of how work is defined and valued and women are always more vulnerable in this system. So, feminists who tend to think that the bigger problem is capitalism are less likely to support interventions that uphold the capitalist framework anyway, right? So giving women access to microcredit, for example, it's a very capitalist solution. It is like, ah, the problem of why some people are poor and disempowered is because they don't have access to credit. Men, it's easier for men to have access to credit because men are more likely to own things as collateral that they can borrow against. So when you go to traditional financial institutions, they're more likely to like, lend you money. Whereas women do not have these things. So maybe if we give women access to credit exclusively or predominantly, maybe that will help their lives. And the model that they think of is, ah, maybe woman having access to credit means easier to have income. Income means more contribution to household expenses, also more leverage in the relationship, easier to leave an abusive relationship, easier to assert rights. So that's a very like uh, neoliberal conception of like empowerment. So the more like Marxist feminists who are like, wait, no, what's going to happen really in this situation is women will now have greater work burdens because they're going to have to work to pay back those loans. They're going to have to start businesses. But you're doing nothing to intervene in terms
terms of like the household relationship. So women still bear most of the domestic work burdens. And then now they have to work outside the home too. So their working hours have doubled. And in terms of where they spend this money, they are less likely to spend this money on themselves or their personal needs. They are more likely to spend this money on their families and uh, on their partners. And their partners are more likely to actually make use of this money, but then they are the ones responsible for the debt in the end. Um, so we've actually made women's lives harder by increasing expectations on them, not just to be mothers and wives, but also to now be providers of their family. But we're not really empowering them because the way it will play out is harms them, right? Uh, and, and now that this option is available, it is harder for women to tell the state some of these things should be provided for free. Education and healthcare should be provided for free. These structural solutions should be things that we are entitled to. But instead now what's happening is they are given a way to earn it and therefore they are now responsible for their own like well-being. And this burden is disproportionately borne by women. Same with like sex work and things like that, right? So some feminists are like, the moment you uphold these solutions of women who sell sex in a world where men control the capital and men control the earnings, you are basically sending a message that men have power over women's bodies because of their ability to purchase these things. And because they have power over them, they get to dictate the terms of the transaction. So these are bad things. But then some other women also are like, yeah, but you can't be too prescriptive. Like, um, we accept that women's choices are never fully free, um, but individual women are better placed to make decisions for themselves about what's good for them. Um, and even in situations that are like constrained, uh, there is still space for agency, there is still space for freedom. Um, and we prefer, a, a, let's say, a capitalist system that is more that can be reformed rather than completely rejected overall. So these feminists are more likely to support like regulation and like pushing to make conditions better as opposed to like a more radical overhaul. Another focal point is uh, integration and how it's viewed in movements. So for some movements it's seen as cooptation, uh, like being accepted on the terms of the majority because they tend to emphasize like features that they have in common with the majority rather than features that make them different. So the whole gay marriage debate, right? Like, are we just trying to be like the heterosexuals at the end of the day? Uh, is that our pitch? And some people are like, that shouldn't be the priority of our movement. We should be rejecting the institution of marriage instead, instead of legitimizing it by desiring it, right? Um, so like, it's really interesting, even the whole idea of like civil rights, uh, there were black supremacist movements. So like, for example, Nation of Islam were against uh, integration because they were like, it's never gonna work for us. They were supported the separation of black and white Americans and the civil rights movement they thought was a bit too soft. Uh, one more thing I would say, and then let's just try. It's also the issue of representation. So who should lead and who should speak for whom? So there, and here are issues of intersexual, uh, intersectionality come into play, right? Because within oppressed groups and within minorities, you do have hierarchies. You do have class hierarchies, right? So within a minority group, you're gonna have the elites. Even these elites do are also oppressed, but not as much as like the more vulnerable members of that community. So let's say in the women's rights group, like a white middle class woman or a white upper class woman with a Harvard degree, someone like Sheryl Sandberg who leads Facebook, is obviously not as vulnerable as a person of color who works in a factory, a woman of color who works in a factory who might be an undocumented immigrant, right? And so their vulnerabilities are very different. And yet, a movement is expected to kind of cater to women in general. So how do you navigate that? Um, so do you, and then there's a criticism of like the very vertical hierarchy and centralized structures of some movements, but at the same time, like, that makes for effective lobbying and advocacy. And you see how some examples about the UK can also discuss. Um, what else? There's a lot here, but I don't want to spend too much time on it. Uh, also, the role of men in women's struggles and women's movements, like do we want them in leadership positions? What does it mean to be a good ally? Should we be uh, using language uh, that is more palatable to men? For example, saying things like the patriarchy also hurts men. We support he for she. Are you familiar with he for she? Emma Watson going? Oh, yeah. yeah so the whole 
the only reason men aren't part of the feminist movement is because I haven't officially invited you, so I will. <laughs> and like, this whole feminism is for everyone because men too are oppressed by the patriarchy. And some women are like, this is true, but can we please not lie that um, the patriarchy does privilege men and that joining will mean giving up some of that privilege. So this kind of like, portrays a very superficial like notion of what it means to be an ally, right? The barrier to entry to being an ally for a movement is low. But there's also a question of like, how much should movements ask of their allies? Do you expect your allies to really display ideological purity? Like, what is the role of heterosexual allies in LGBT movements? What is the role of men in feminism? It's quite interesting. Um, but... And then the strategies to use, which we should talk about in chatty ways. All right. I'm mostly done with the framing. Do we want to go ask questions and extract things from there? Um, yeah, so, okay, so basically, I think that because it's so few of us, yeah. I think that it probably works best if you guys tell us what kind of things you struggle with or you would like to work in in regards to social movement debates. I, I think that there's. It's not. I, actually, I won most of those clashes when they happen, but I think they're really often, and I love to talk about them. It's the idea that for a lot of social movement debates, it's going to be the debate versus do we want more followers or more committed followers? And I know, I, I'm trying to think of an example debate, but it's really. I can't think of one. But I, I have a feeling that they happen often. Absolutely. I guess, like, one example of this is. You know, with the celebrity buy-in of, so performative boldness, like people signaling and virtue signaling their commitment to specific social causes, but not actually like really understanding. It's a Taylor Swift type of feminism, right? <laughs> so do we prefer a world where more people call themselves feminists, but actually uh, are less aware of, like are less willing to give up meaningfully privileges or but then you have like greater kind of superficial buy-in, or do you demand more ideological purity from your members? It's a good question. Yeah. That was an interesting debate I was had actually. Like, do we think performance wokeness and virtue signaling is by elites, for example, is actually good for feminism? Yeah, I mean it's it's hard for me in that those kinds of debates to try and prove. It's it's kind of abstract to compare, so these social movements always won't change in some kind of way, but it's hard yeah. to compare, does this change come from, oh, we have more people, so more people won't, or does this change come from someone actually doing something from that movement who's supposedly more dedicated? And it's always, it's always really abstract where that line is, I'm not sure how to navigate, it's hard for me to impact either one of those, like, I think most of the clashes that come out, oh, it's a wash, but this guy maybe has a slightly more impact. So I think it's quite common to have difficulty impacting social movements, but I do think that there are debates that need to be impacted, and I do think that if you, as a team, are able to reach that this is how we achieve change, you're much better able to do that. Um, well, to win the debate if you manage to impact it. I think that the two ways that you point out is one of the ways in which it manifests. Do we want more committed followers or do we just want more of them? So I think we can sort of talk about both of those separately and how we go about impacting sort of how do we get to the end goal of helping women or helping LGBT individuals. Um, so let's, let's, let's choose one. Let's go for we want more committed followers even if it's less of them. I think that then what you can say is that the kinds of things that lead to social movements obtaining change are necessarily things that are disruptive, but also importantly, secondly, come from members that are willing to sacrifice themselves for the movement. So the kinds of like, like feminists walking the streets and protesting against sexual assault or spending a lot of time, effort, money into pursuing sexual assault cases or actively lobbying governments or instead of voting for the Democrats, voting for someone else, they're all things that you need to be committed for the movement and committed to, well, basically willing to sacrifice something in order to do. Because if you don't vote for the feminist movement or the feminist politics, politician, you can vote for whoever else you want. If you 
don't protest, then you don't have to deal with all of the backlash. If you're a lawyer and you're deliberately only defending sexual assault cases, you're probably earning less money. Like all of these things that you need people that are able to understand and sacrifice. I think that the second thing that you can say is that the problem when you try to attract more members is that you necessarily have to make the movement nice. Like you don't want, if you want to attract like loads and loads of men, you can't say that sexual assault is a massive problem because maybe that will offend some men who will go like, but not all men. Or if you want to attract white people, you also cannot be so aggressive in the language of like, but white people are just super racist in the United States. Like it's everyone. You need to be like, oh yeah, only some people. Um, so you do have to moderate your language a lot, and that means that you never get the change because you never even get the conversation started, and you cannot push for the kinds of things that you want and that you need, precisely because even pushing for that means that you alienate people from the movement. So I think that those are two ways in which you can get to sort of like, this is how we achieve change. Does this sort of make sense? Or yeah. Do you want to impact it further? Yeah. Um, so then we can talk about the other one as well. So like, how was having mass amounts of people get, get to the point. So I think that that was actually more intuitive. So I don't know, like, what do you guys think? How would you run that line of analysis? How would you run more by equals greater chance of success? I mean, I would probably say, but I, I do that in most debates, but I would just, okay, so the usual, this is, uh, Politicians have to cater to the voters, a lot of voters care about this issue. Yeah. It, and it's, it's not even, you do not have to be that committed to dislike a certain candidate enough not to vote. So I think it, I, 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 I'm impacted, and I usually do it in two ways. Like, okay, it's not only that they vote for someone who may push progressive policy, but at least they're going to not vote for someone who's pushing restrictive and, and yeah. oppressive yeah. policy. And that's still an immediate benefit for all of these people. And then, I think, I mean, the whole analysis, I think, is used so much in the debate, like, oh, now politicians cater, to, have to cater to this group because they're a significant, a significant part of it, and now we get some policy because now there's political will and political capital for it. Yeah, I also think that there's a different, basically, like, there's two ways, I think, in which the critical mass thing is important. I think the best one is that you just need massive amounts of people in order to be able to achieve the things that you want as a movement. So in order to vote for the policies that you want, or at least not vote against things that are going to make it worse for you. Um, I think that, actually I think there's more, yeah, so I think there's four things actually that you can do. So I think that that's one of them. I think that the second one is that also like getting more people also means that you have like more successful events, that you see more popular the movement, that you get more money, that you're able to and you can like do things that are good for women or good for LGBT people. Like if you get more people who support LGBT youth, you get more charities that help out like individuals who have been kicked out of their house and are homeless because they're gay. Um, and that's really important, right? I think that also, thirdly, you talk about how the way that you get those really committed people is by an initial approach. So if people always think that you're crazy and radical and they don't want to like engage with you because they just think that you're like the radical feminists who don't like the men, then they're never going to enjoy you in the first place. So once you join, even if it's because of Emma Watson, that's when you can begin to give information and talk to individuals about the real issues and how it plays out for them in the real world. And that's how you get them committed in the first place. So I think that's a way to sort of co-opt the other side. And I think that that also gives you an advantage because you're able to talk about the movement with more nuance. Not all, like the, the feminist movement is not universally composed of just Emma Watson and he for she. There are other nuances to it, but the problem is that you need that entry point, yeah. like the gateway for people to enter the movement. Yeah. I guess you can also talk about like how lobbying works. Uh, you do gains build upon each other, right? So sometimes it might work to first argue for the least common denominator, the most socially palatable gains and start building on them slowly. So, gay marriage, fair enough. Gay marriage doesn't represent the interest of the entirety of the LGBT spectrum. There are genuine economic issues like employment discrimination. Um, the fact that not all of them like, see themselves in like, like heterosexually modeled relationships, right? But you can argue that to be given formal equality in the eyes of the law in terms of like being given a right that other people are being given 
it's a giant victory, not just for those who want to access marriage, but for this identity itself. Like you are, it's a signal of equality, right? And it slowly then changes the way society thinks of you. And uh, it's kind of just like a sequencing thing. And building on this game, you can fight for like other things. Or I suppose like the feminist movement. So we had this debate in Shanghai actually, um, including religious women in the feminist movement. What are you giving up? What are you gaining? So as Lucia said, obviously, you are going to have to moderate and kind of deal with the criticisms you make. You will probably have a harder time pushing hard on abortion because this is usually the bright line for a lot of religious women, right? At the same time, if you have religious women on board in your campaign against domestic violence, you might win, you have a greater chance of winning that campaign because these are the women that more conservative men are more likely to listen to uh, who can make the case to them, right? They are, the, they are the women who raise daughters who can tell them don't tolerate violence, don't tolerate abuse. These are the women who otherwise might have chosen not to send their daughters to school or insisting on them getting married earlier uh, that you might want to win over. And these are important wins, but you are giving something. It might be harder to argue for LGBT rights. It might be harder to argue for abortion. And uh, one side will go, this is dangerous because if you compromise, like you don't just get to turn around and uh, pretend that that compromise didn't happen, right? You are publicly beholden to that position you've taken, that you've also kind of, you are seen as rejecting these things as well. And you foreclose the possibility of those things of campaigning for those things later on, or it's harder to explain the shift down the line, right? Um, but some people might argue, look, but there are also other urgent battles that you could actually win, and you have accountability on that front too. So like a good example would be the feminist movement in the Philippines. We originally did not have access to condoms or contraception at all. Like, this only was 30 to arrive in 2013. So local governments would ban the sale of condoms in, uh, in their vicinity in their jurisdiction. So the feminist movement was like, we need the reproductive health legislation. The strategy of the conservatives was to conflate contraception with abortion. They were like, it's the same thing. And because abortion is really unpopular, that, that could have been used to uh, block even contraception. So the feminists had to make a choice, and they had to say, this is not abortion. We are fighting for contraception only. And we are happy to pass a law that says abortion will still be banned. Uh, for some of the feminists, this was just a tactical concession because women were dying from unwanted pregnancies. Um, and we were hoping at least we could reduce those, right? For other feminists, this was a genuine moral line. Does this mean the ability to campaign for abortion later on harder? Yes. Because you just publicly said no to that, right? And now there's a law that enshrines that more clearly and then you have to overturn that. So I guess it's sort of the whole trade-off thing of like more least common denominator really, but there are things you could give up. Did you have a question? No. Okay. Um, cool. Next up. Yeah, so I think that that's a, quite a common clash. I think that the last one I guess is that maybe not necessarily, or at least with when when you make more people join your movement, I think it's also quite easier to call out bad behavior that happens from them. Ask yes. how dare you call yourself an ally of yeah. an ally against racism and yet you engage in this problematic behavior and then that individual is more likely to change their minds given that they're already part of the movement or at least derive some sort of um, respect or like virtue from being part of the movement. Yeah. So it's like it's easier to tell men to not be dicks to women when they're already calling themselves feminists rather than when they when they when they're not affiliated with the movement. Um, so I think that those are all sort of things that you can get on the clash, but I think that essentially it, it's all pretty similar to that, to sort of like what are the concessions that you're making against the potential benefits or your ability to go back and backtrack on those concessions later. Um, so I think well, that's one quite common clash. Can you, um, yeah. Yeah, can, and can you, this is actually maybe more of a formative question, I guess it depends on the motion, but those, if you are on the side that wants more committed, can you claim just, okay, we realize we're not getting political power, but principally we cannot support whatever concession we have to make? 
and you can make a principal point here. I mean, it has a practical impact because of you're conceding something bad, but just like, yeah. is, is there a principle of purity of the movement that can have an impact in the debate? I think that, although, I think that principal arguments are quite difficult to impact on social yeah. movements. Um, I think that actually it's quite common, commonly a mistake that happens in social movement debates when people are like, it's all about the principle of equality, but they don't really impact it on how it affects women on the ground or gay people on the ground. I think that's a mistake. I think that those debates, particularly those debates, even more than just the ones about IR ones, they are very, very much about the real life impacts that this has on people. So I do think that if you run purity of the movement arguments, they have to be run on a, this is how the purity affects our ability to advocate for things. So in regards to purity of the movement, I think that it affects your ability to be persuasive. Um, I think that, for example, like if you're running a red line on abortion, so for a, a common debate or like a debate on abortion that sometimes happens, it's like, should we, in a country that hasn't legalized abortion yet, should we advocate for abortion if the woman wants it, even if she didn't, like if she just got pregnant, uh, should she still be able to access an abortion, or should we only allow it under certain specific circumstances, or like rape, or if the baby has a horrible yeah, disease that the is going to be, or health risks to the mother. So which one should we do? And I think that in some cases you can argue that you should have ideological purity because that's more convincing. Because if you say that you should only have abortion under these circumstances, then you are admitting that there's something inherently wrong with the act of abortion, that therefore it should only be done under these very horrible, extreme circumstances. And that means that people are better able to argue against it and to say, you're conceding that there's something horrible about it. And that means that we shouldn't ever do it because it's horrible. And like, there's many things that you can say in defense of that, right? Um, so I think that in many ways, making strategic concessions actually makes your position weaker and it makes your ability to advocate to individuals on the middle ground lesser because if you as a person who doesn't really have like an opinion on abortion and you're like oh yeah like, i guess it's weird that the feminist movement is admitting that there's something kind of bad with abortion maybe maybe the conservatives are really right and we should never do it um so i think that that yeah I, but, but that's again sort of like a, a real life impact on how those that ideological purity affect our ability as a movement to help women out. Yeah, I guess also you can argue that you are betraying the most vulnerable yeah. members of your movement who are the ones who need the most radical reforms. So, I mean, this is the whole, you see this with the Democrats now, right? The whole Joe Biden versus Bernie Sanders debate, right? Like, if you want a slightly more palatable, less threatening member of your movement, but they might not be as willing to call out acts of injustice. They might not be as um, willing to demand like full protections for the most vulnerable workers. And, but they are the ones who are supposed to be most accountable to because they are the most vulnerable. So even within movements, there is privilege. I guess that might be one way to make the, the argument. Of course, the other child is going to go, but were you actually going to succeed in the first place at helping yeah. them? At which point then you have two options, or you can do both. One, you're saying, fine, it's not perfect, but we actually were on our way to that, and there were, and then you changing the strategy makes that harder. I mean, it interrupts that. Or second, that you actually make it harder or impossible. Yeah. Because, like, so either you've expanded all your political capital on a more tokenistic and superficial reform, or you've, in, in, like, uh, you've. Like public interest is finite, and the moment it seems like you've won the battle, it becomes harder to advocate for other things. Or you might have made like philosophical and moral concessions, the stuff Lucy was talking about, that then make, that makes it hard to backtrack from. So there are ways to get. I think that additionally, so like just to add something quick to that, um, I think that additionally, it's not just about how your ideological, like your ideological concessions make it harder to argue. And as with the example of the Philippines, the fact that you make a concession means that later you're less able to backtrack from that because there's like legislation because you already had a position on it. But I think that additionally, talking about inter-movement dynamics is yeah. also quite useful. So for example, like when you prioritize women, like when you as a feminist movement put at the forefront of your movement, like choice feminism, feminism that says like, ah, oh, whatever women choose to do, it's fine. If you choose to be a housewife, that's fine. It's your choice. If you choose to like, have children, that's fine, because that is your choice. Or if you choose to like, 
um, I don't like basically whatever you want, it's fine. That's problematic because then it means that the kind of conversations and the kind of people that rise through the ranks of the movement and dominate conversations are people who are already kind of fine in the status quo. Yeah. Like sure, housewives have problems, but in countries where that's an established path for women, being a housewife probably has a lot less problems with it than wanting to, I don't know, like be a professor and remain single and not have children your whole life. Yeah. So you are allowing these people to dominate the movement, which means that the voices of others are not listened to ever. Like the feminist movement then becomes a movement that doesn't advocate for the people that you left behind. So I think that talking about intermovement dynamics is also quite useful in that regard, that like the movement itself changes and is less able to advocate for those that you left behind. Can, can you ex Expand, and is, is it possible to expand that analysis with the idea that, or is it taking too far? So, okay, if we do this and we have this concession that we make, and that, that you can get splits in your movement, because today, you know, the feminist movement is a, as we have read, yeah, is it, yeah, it can, can it then impact it like, okay, but we are now losing this part of it. Like, yeah, we, we got more like, we can maybe have more casual people that that's those commit those it's not that we're not getting new community guys and now they have their own small movement yeah. and now you have one small movement of really committed radical people and us casuals who are yeah. just standing here that's a risk mm -hmm. that you split the movement but i don't but if you also stick to purity then the, then you would also have a smaller movement right so you yeah. have to show that the splintering is more helpful i guess yeah, yeah. I, I think that's the splintering that if I would run that, I would always that be more mitigation. So even if when they splinter, they're still bigger, but they're yeah, not yeah. that bigger, yeah. you know? And they also, you can say that they create competitions for themselves, right? Because in, at least in the status where you can kind of frame, ah, oh, it's us versus, versus them, but here it's us versus them versus them versus them. Yeah. Because, uh, this competition angle is actually really interesting because Obviously, you know, and this is the funding question now, right? Obviously, movements compete with each other for funding. Some of them do a principled line and are like, we're not going to take money from corporate sponsors, we're not going to take money from like religious institutions because it affects our agenda. But yes, what happens when movements in a similar space have to compete with each other for funding? Obviously, the ones that are more organized, that are run by people with degrees, and who can write more sophisticated grant proposals yeah, in other states likely get privileged. And, all, and if you look at it from the perspective of funders, uh, they also tend to prefer movements that are less radical in their strategies. Yeah. So if I am an environmentalist movement and I'm like, yeah, part of my strategy actually includes some violence for you. <laughs> Like, yeah, yeah. Okay. probably less likely to get funding from a mainstream donor. Yeah, we, we, we are we are an environmental movement with like a slight pinch of eco terrorism. Yeah, yeah. It's it's hard to tell that. So one interesting example that I mean might be useful in debating and just life is uh, U.S. government funds, right? They do not allow their funds to be used for abortion, which means U.S. government money in international aid uh, situations can never fund abortions for rape victims, even if they are minors, which is absurd. And because the money goes into a common pot with money from the UK, money from the US, UN, from the Red Cross, in effect, it kind of makes it hard for any money to be used to fund abortions. Um, any money that the US gives to anti-trafficking or, anti or HIV prevention cannot be used in any way to promote prostitution. So any organization that receives this funding has to sign an agreement that says they must always oppose prostitution and that when and, and they must prove that they are attempting to rescue sex workers. So if you are working with sex workers who are at risk of HIV, how are you even going to be effective if you first have to demonstrate that you're trying to rescue them? So even sex workers who want to unionize and get legal assistance against police violence will not have access to this funding. But the people who want to end sex work have billions in funding, right? So that matters, like where the money comes from and where you take money matters too. Yeah. So I think that so overall for the people that just joined, um, what we're basically because 
since there's so many of us. So what we're basically talking about is what kind of clashes you guys sometimes find in social justice or social movement debates that you'd like to talk about and discuss more in detail. But like we do think that I'm talking about them and like learning more examples or lines or analysis quite well. So the one that we have been chatting about is like do you want more committed members or do you want more members overall? Um, I think that manifests itself in things like should we take funding from certain governments or certain corporations? Um, should we demand certain things from our members? Should we attempt to make our messages more palatable to the overwhelming population rather than more radical? Um, I think that there's other different clashes that also pop up a lot in social movements. Um, I'm going to sort of ask if anyone has any other clashes that they'd like to talk about or discuss, but I'll give you some time to think about and in the mean, about that. And in the meantime, um, I'm going to highlight one that I think is quite useful, particularly in, social, in uh, feminism debates. Um, which is sort of like the second wave feminism versus the third wave feminism, um, which I think is quite a common one in feminism debates. I think that a lot of really good classic feminism debates are always going to be, in some way, shape, or form, a clash between two ideas. One is the idea that women have a choice and that if they want to be like housewives, as I said before, like housewives, or if they want to not be professors, or if they want to have loads of children, or if they want to like wear makeup and heels, or not wear makeup and heels and not shave their armpits, whatever women choose, it's fine, because they're beings that have the ability to make those choices for themselves. And the other one is this idea that the reason why women want to do certain things, like wear makeup or shave, or um, be housewife, or get married, or have children, isn't because they want to, but rather because society indoctrinates them in some way to want those things. And how therefore we need to oppose those things that women want. Mm -hmm. Or not oppose it, but rather try to fight against the structures that lead to women doing those things. Obviously those two clash quite a bit, just because the other side is like, no, you shouldn't, because if women want to be housewives and you're trying to make it more difficult for them, then that's bad. Feminism should be about whatever women want, and if women want it, fine. Whereas the other is, no, because what women want in this case is bad, and it's oppressive, and it is leading them towards worse lives, and they'll be pushed towards that by forces outside of their control. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think this is quite a common clash that oftentimes plays out in in rounds, a uh, common one that we were discussing earlier, um, or that someone brought up earlier, is this idea of whether or not the feminist movement should support um, celebrities that use nudity or promiscuity in their music videos or in their art. Because the choice ones would be like, yeah, third wave feminism, these women are choosing to portray themselves in this way, they're owning their bodies, they are empowered. The other side would say, no, the reason why they're utilizing their sexuality in this way is because men are telling them that this is how you're attractive and that you need to use your body as a tool to obtain whatever it is that you want. You don't see men in music videos usually getting naked. You see them like powerful or something. Yeah. Um, so that's like, I think that that's a clash that oftentimes plays out. Um, and I think that there's several different ways to talk about that as well. Um, I think one of the ways to talk about it is how you're perceived. Um, so sort of like the classic, what the people in society, what are they going to think if we support this or if we support that. I think another quite important one is also which people you're affecting more and which ones you're throwing under the bus a little bit. Um, so I think that in some ways it's not just the support of population but rather the support of women who enjoy wearing short skirts and like low cut tops is probably going to go away or at least they're going to feel uncomfortable supporting these kinds of movements if they are told that the reason why they're doing it is because like the men indoctrinated you into it. Yeah. Um, I equally think that also the other side can come back and say yeah but those women are or like women who want to be housewives are probably fine. If you want to have children, society accepts that and in many cases supports you in your goal to do that. Whereas if you want to do something else and something different, if you don't want to have children, then there's immense amounts of pressure on you to do it. So that is why we need to support those women more if those are the women that we betray when we say it's all just a choice. You need to respect everyone's choice. Um, I think that this is quite a common class to be aware of. 
And I think it's quite useful when you get like a debate like this one to immediately be like, all right, we're on this side, or we're on this side. How do we develop arguments originating from this particular stance that we as a movement are taking? Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. The other thing I wanted to talk about is um, this very simplicity. I, I guess it's not an issue at your level because um, well, I think you've been debating quite enough. But it's also homogenization of like, all women, therefore, uh, all women are always progressive or uh, secular is not true, right? So the whole, I mean, some women are critical of the feminist movement for not taking into account things like religion, um, because they're like, some of us find a way to reconcile our religiosity with our feminism. Um, the other thing is, like, some women are not necessarily progressive in that if you think about um, honor killings, for example, Women are a common perpetrator of them, or like active instigator of them. I mean, you see women slut shaming other women. So not, not in the context of uh, the way Lucia described it, because you can make a you can make an argument that women relying on physical appearance to succeed reinforces patriarchal norms. But the conclusion of that argument is we do want equality, but we think equality is hampered if we. Uh, if we end up reinforcing uh, double standards, right? So that's a different argument. But there's also the argument of you shouldn't wear short skirts or you shouldn't um, look physically attractive because if you do so, you would be deserving of sexual violence. So these are very, these are two very different arguments. One of them may potentially still have a feminist conclusion, while the other one literally is like we live in a world where we would like to police the way women dress, because we do not think they have the same set of entitlements as men, right? Um, so the women making that argument are not feminists, right? So this, this is a thing to consider. I, mean, it's, I think it's a good example, but I, it's not fair to use because it's a Croatian one. So then I like using international debates, but not for anyone else. <laughs> uh, the, the leader of the... So, in Croatia, you have an organization that's led by basically an older conservative woman, which is the biggest organization against... Uh, they're most against abortion, but they're against everything that's going to be progressive. And then what, what, what also often happens in the base is like, oh yeah, but you know, if women are not for feminism, and there's clearly a woman on top of yeah. this movement against feminism, it really delegitimizes everything that, that, right. that goes yeah, against exactly. it. So this contention that woman equals feminism yeah. And, and they, they also what they do something that when you mention the religion and they, it's it's a hilarious example but it's a sad one what they do is that in front of abortion clinics they'll let 10 or 15 of them will come and they'll pray for everyone who's entering inside and trying to get yeah, into yeah, it yeah, like, yeah. 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 yeah that's, <laughs> what that's, if it yeah. makes you feel better the feminist movement counteracted that and started being there with them and supporting those who are going in so yeah. And yeah, it's. It, it, but where I was going with this is that, it's that thing. I think that when in a debate you can prove that hey, this makes m more women be not be feminists. At that point, you can make an impact that says this largely delegitimizes the movement because it has fem in its name. It should be stand for all that they are not agreeing with this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just to re restate that example that I used in the other lecture. The whole tension, again, between the black feminists and white feminists, right? So black feminists are very wary of the white feminist emphasis on the police and on criminal justice as a solution to most problems. So white feminists are always like, ah, domestic violence, bring in the police. Ah, rape, bring in the police. And, and black feminists are like, wait, you're doing great. Our families and our community have a very different relationship with the police than yours. And we don't necessarily support solutions that are very police-centric. And I'm like, yeah, that's fair. And they're like, basically, you're making a choice between like, these feminist goals and our brothers and our fathers and all of this. So how do you resolve this? Is a bit like murky. Yeah, yeah I think that's another quite useful yeah. way to sometimes talk or conceptualize debates about social movements, as in it's oftentimes that the goals of different individuals within the social movement are going to come at odds. What the white cis gay men want is probably quite different to the kinds of things that trans individuals might want in the LGBT movement. What black women want 
is quite different. I think that a good example of that is, for example, sexuality. Um, in many ways, the myth of like white womanhood and how like white women are like pure. Um, in many cases, white women want to be able to own their sexuality if they want to, whereas black women, in many cases, are stereotyped in a completely opposite way of like very sexual, very like sex-driven animals yeah. that are not they're not like pure. So in many in those cases, the kinds of things that they want to change are different because the respective stereotypes are very different. Yeah. Um, so in many cases, those things come at odds, and it happens like in the LGBT movement, it happens within the feminist movement. Um, it equally happens like in uh, I think in race tends to be a bit more, or there, seem, there tends to be less clear trade-offs. But equally, like if you are a black person that passes, so that you don't speak, you speak in like a, a, a way that white people accept more, or your skin is a lighter tone, or your hair just passes more, um, and you're able to like understand cultural references that people from the like mainstream community understand more, rather than just very specific ones to your ethnicity, like is that a thing that you should be attempting to do, or should you conversely try and like be super be like black and proud and identify more with that identity than with the mainstream one. Um, so I think that oftentimes in those debates talking about the or at least being aware of the differences in the movement is quite useful. And I think it's also if you're extending, it's also quite a useful way to try and look for impacts. Just in regards to even if it benefits some people in the movement, how does it affect individuals who might not be super happy with the direction that the movement is taken? Because in many cases those individuals tend to be less poor, less able to advocate for themselves, have less voice in the movement, be more oppressed. Yeah. Um, and therefore prioritizing them as a social movement might be something that you might want to do. So I think that talking about those things within social movement debates is also quite useful. And on an option of that is We've essentially been discussing it, but this whole idea of intersectionality, be mindful of it. Um, so, uh, like one example I use for this is juries that are more likely to convict, uh, to not convict in the cases of rape, are juries composed of middle aged women. And they're less likely to convict in the cases of rape because they think of their sons. So, middle aged white women are like the worst for rangers, because they don't really listen to the victim, they're very prone to believing like character assassination by the defense authorities, because they imagine, what if my son was accused of this? So you see like the weird dynamics there, so their role as like middle class, white, uh, probably conservative background, uh, versus like potentially younger victim, especially if it's a woman of color, and uh, like, as Lucia said, right, women of color generally like more exoticized and perceived as like less innocent. Or even in a lot of far right campaigns against immigration, you always have the image of the white woman being threatened by foreign men. This rape metaphor is crazy. Like, it's literally we must protect our women against Middle Eastern, Arab, and African men. And the result of this is your borders are heavily policed. And it results in deaths of men, obviously, but also women. Undocumented women migrants have a harder time entering, and when they do come in undocumented, they're a lot more vulnerable, and then enter the sex trade, uh, and all of these things. But yeah, the figure of the innocent white woman is a very feminist trope that is also compatible with far-right ideologies. Yeah, um, so in regards to what I asked before, do people have any different clashes that they often find challenging in social justice or social movement debates that they would like to talk about? Uh, there was a, well, I think it's a specific clash, but there was a motion in the Munich final. Uh, I get it, but I, I have no idea how to resolve that clash with opposition opposition. The motion was something along the lines of this house believes that um, women that are running for public office or just Campaigning should adopt traditional female roles such as you know being a, a mother or yeah. a stay at home wife or whatever. Um, so and then we have the clash of do I work within the framework of a society that we portray as still patriarchal even in the America, for example, and do we gain more public support by appealing to most probably men and quite a lot of women? 
or is it more important to be to try and you know get the progressive white uh, the progressive young people on, on your side? Like I think yeah. yeah. Um, so that's quite interesting. Um, we had a candidate that was kind of like that in Mexico at some point a few years ago. Um, Vasquez Mota, she was great. She was great for the debates. She would always be like, I am a woman, but I, I'm also a woman. Oh my god. And a doctor and a wife. <laughs> and just be like, she would just list several different like feminine adjectives for herself. It would be incredible. <laughs> she obviously lost. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but that's what she tried to do, right? She tried to like mobilize support by being like, hi, the wife. Um, I think that in that regard, there's overall sort of like three strains that I think both teams would try to get at. So one is, what makes you more electable? Because um, then presumably if you get elected, you're a woman, you're better able to like pass things that are good for women. Mm -hmm. Even though as Charm said, that's an assumption that you make about this candidate, because mm -hmm. you might not. Um, and then secondly, it's sort of, if you are indeed a woman that will advocate for good things for other women, are you better able to do that once you're in office? If yeah. you have the support of people who voted for you because you're a wife and you play into a traditional gender role, mm -hmm. or are you better able to enact change if you have the support of a different subset of the population? I think that lastly, it's not just the effect on your ability to run as a candidate and function as a president or as a whatever uh, MP, um, but also how does this affect the way that society perceives women in power and like does it make it harder for future women if you run on your traditional gender roles or does it make it easier if you don't do it for women who don't necessarily fit within the stereotypes of like being a good housewife or a good mother. Um, so I think that those are sort of like the three things that you can more or less talk about. And I do think that in both sides, it's a good thing to talk about. Um, I think of the first one, which is the one that you mentioned and we're getting at, is the what, which, which, which bit do you mobilize? Um, so I think that in that one, it's just basically like, these are the different bits of the population that we are able to attract with different demographics. And I think that you, you would have to do some way in regards to which one is more likely to come up and vote, which one is more numerous, which one is more likely to 